those are in the embodied soul who has controlled his nature, having renounced all actions by the mind inwardly, dwells at ease in the city of nine gates, neither working nor causing work to be done. So the word here used is vashi, which is the last word in the second line. It means a person who's controlled their nature. That's a person who's in control of everything, including their senses, body, mind, desires, and has won all, over, all of them. Okay, such a person dwells at ease, and one who has not won over his desires will always be in dualities, in a dilemma, and therefore will always be at unease. Not only that, but the deeper he falls into his desires, then the more downward he goes. That's why the word Vashi is a very important word. Many people have Vashi as their surname, but who knows how much they are in control of themselves. First of, per first of all, a person who has got rid of their egotism is Vashi. Because unease and moods come from egotism. The bigger one's conception of themselves, then the more that they are at unease. Such a person is very dependent upon their conception of themselves. Because where does egotism come from? It comes from, what's it raw material? Some people's egotism comes from their good looks. That they say that I am handsome or she says that I am beautiful. The bigger that such a power they make for themselves, then the bigger that their ego is. Some other people's egotism comes from their possessions or their wealth. The bigger their pile of possessions, then the bigger they are. Others have piles for power, fame, praise, respect, status, and the bigger these things are, then the bigger they are. If so, what then is making them big? They are becoming big because of others. It could be anything, be it skin, currency notes, letters, emails of admiration, people clapping and applause, but anything, all of this means that they're becoming big because of others. If someone is becoming big because of others, then it won't take them long to become small because of others. As soon as this support from others gets out of the way, then just like someone can make you big, they can make you small. A person that can put a, garland of, a necklace of garlands around you can also put a necklace of thorns around you. This can happen. If I feel big when someone puts a necklace of garlands on me, then this feeling of being big is very fragile. It is a show of feeling big. If you read about politics in newspapers, then I won't need to explain it further. A woman who has had a really great status in society, who was worshipped, is now criticised because people that have made her in this position of status can also criticise her. This is a very fragile sense of being big. This feeling of being big comes from other people because egotism always comes from other people. That's why such a person can never be at ease and is always at unease. How many people make them feel bigger? If you are good, if someone calls you good, then how much control do you give to other people? Then you always think about whether other people will say good things about you. All people have different natures. Tunde, tunde, matira, bina. Yet to make happy all these people, you have to say the same thing. A person loses their identity because of this. He becomes like a figure of clay where people can just mold him in whatever way they like. When children come to play with this figure, then it never tries, they just keep changing it. A person becomes like this figure, he has no identity for himself. A person who does not have an identity is played with like children, like this figure of clay. But a person who has their own identity is placed in an art gallery. Then it's not important what identity, is not important what identity is made for you. The more lumpish and unclear that a person is, and the more childish the person is, and the clearer the person is, if the person is that like that, they've lost their confidence. The confidence is very fragile. But the clearer the person is, the more decided their identity is for themselves and not for other people. And the more in tune they are with themselves, then the more they become at steady and at ease. And that's the secret of confidence. Next part of this verse, whenever Guruji is explaining how hard it is for people to control their natures and also desires, he always used the example of Gemini in the scriptures. When the story of Yayati comes in the Srimad Bhagwat, Vyasji, who has written the Gita and the Srimad Bhagwat, has written a verse saying, Mata Sasva Dohitrava Na Vivita Sanobavit Balavan Indriya Gramo Vidvansh Api Karshani, meaning a mother, sister, or daughter 
should not one should not sit in the same seat as the mother, sister or daughter because the pull of the senses is so strong that they pull even the most wisest people. In the olden days, our elders used to follow this principle and respect it. But nowadays, independence, which is not bad, but when it turns into willfulness, then these relations don't stay there and there's many cases of incest. Vyasji wrote that the senses pull even the most knowledgeable people. When Gemini, the Acharya Gemini read this, and he went to Marshri Vyas and told him that what he has written is wrong. He asked him why he has written that even the most knowledgeable people are swayed by the senses. He said that he agreed in the previous three lines that one should not sit in the same seat as the mother, the sister and daughter because the sense, strength of the senses are strong, that they can fool people. However, then he said that there should be a amendment in the last line. So instead of saying they pull even the most wise people, it should be replaced by they pull ordinary people, but they cannot pull the most knowledgeable people. Vyasti told Geminiji that what he has written is correct. Geminiji was not ready to accept it, and Vyasti told him calmly that when the occasion arises, then it will prove it to him. Some time went, an occasion arose when Gemini was going, G, Gemini G was going back to his ashram at night and the monsoon season came. The rain was falling outside and there was a fire light, lighted in his ashram to provide light. Gemini was using this light to write something. His attention suddenly fell to a door and he saw a young girl standing wet and shivering because of the rain and she was standing by the door. She was extremely beautiful and as soon as Gemini saw her, he kept staring at her. He tried to move his attention away from her, but his attention kept going there. After some time, Gemini G told her to come inside the house. The young girl initially said no because she had no trust in men, verse 13. Gemini asked her how could she not trust someone like him. He asked her if she knew who he was. He told her that he was the Acharya of the whole region and a very wise person and so she should trust him and come inside. The young girl came inside. His clo her clothes were wet because of the rain and she was shivering. Gemini G gave her some of his clothes and told her to wear it until her clothes dried. She was so young, she was changing her clothes in the corner and Gemini G's attention kept falling her way. The more he saw her beauty, then the more his desire for her grew. He quietly asked her whether she would marry him. The young girl asked Acharya what he was saying and told him that it was not right for him. She told him that he was such a knowledgeable person, an Acharya, and yet he did not even know who she was and which family she came from. She just asked him how could he then marry her. Gemini G told her that there was no need for the family because akrutim mana katare, meaning you're so beautiful and your appearance is so nice that your family must be nice. He told her that she looked so beautiful and he didn't want anything in the world apart from her and he told her that he wanted to marry her. The young girl told him that she had hesitations. Gemini G asked her what were her hesitations in getting married. The young girl told him that she had given a promise to her father that she would only get married to a youth that would make their face black, be like a horse, and let her sit on top while walking around the fire four times. She told him that he was such a knowledgeable person in Acharya, so how could she possibly ask him to do this? Gemini Ji thought that it was dark and it was night time and the area was isolated so nobody would know if he fulfilled her condition. He thought that they would have a proper wedding in the morning and told her not to worry because nobody would know. He told her that he accepted her condition. Gemini G painted his face black. Our scriptures say that a person who destroys their principles always has a black face. He painted his face black and acted like a horse. The young girl sat on his back and he went round the fire three times. As soon as he was about to go round the fourth time, Vyasji came and stood at the front door and asked Gemini G what was going on. Gemini G was shocked and embarrassed. He went so pale in the body that no blood could be seen. Vashi asked him whether he should write that the senses pull even the most knowledgeable people or that the senses do not pull even the most knowledgeable people. Gemini said, no Vyasji, you are right. The senses pull even the most knowledgeable people. The pull of the senses are so strong that they pull the wisest of all people. The attractions of desires are so strong that they can pull one away. There's a very famous event written by Vyasji right at the beginning of the Mahabharat, right at the root of the Mahabharat, to do with Barash Muni, uh, when you had to cross the river. Who's heard of this? Barash Muni. Okay. Matsya Gandha 
was standing there. She's called Matsya Ganda, meaning one who smells a fish. And he needed to cross the other side, so he sat on the boat. She smelt of raw fish, and so nobody would come near her. But she was a youth, and her body was beautiful. Barash Muni was swayed by a beautiful body. When the boat reached halfway, he held Matsya Ganda's hand. Matsya Ganda ji asked the Muni, what are you doing? Because the Rishi was so knowledgeable. He told her that he had a wish. She said that people would see. On both sides of the river, there were people who would see. This would do little to her, but be very bad for the sage. Barash Muni told her not to worry, because with his mystic power, he would create dense clouds, blocking the light from the sun and turning everything into complete darkness so that nobody could see them. Think about this. The Muni, this is a Muni who had done a lot of penance. Saints say that he had done, must have done so many penances that he could create clouds around the sun, yet he could not even control his own senses. The Rishi could hide the sun, but he could not hide his desires. Balavan in the Agamo, Vidvan Samit Rashi, meaning even to the learned person, the senses are very strong and can pull him away. The senses are extremely powerful. A person must be such a great karma yogi to reach this state of vashi, self-control. One cannot become a vashi through suppression. We immediately think that being vashi is all about suppression. You cannot control anything through suppression, even your own nature, but you can control your nature through understanding or when you grow out or mature. Just like when the child grows up and loses interest in playing with dolls, in the same way, a person can lose interest in any desire. You have to control your nature through understanding. Such a person is Vashi. Age is not important for this. It does not happen when the senses become weak and lose their power. When a person's sight becomes weak and a pearl comes in front of the eyes, then they cannot see it properly, yet want to see it. If someone controls their sen nature after the senses become weak and lose their power, then this is impotent Vashi. A person who is Vashi, while their senses are strong, such a person become, is one who renounces all karmas with the mind. How then can one create this understanding? You must understand further the 13 things, let's go back a bit, that Sri Krishna described in the 8th and 9th verses of this chapter. So 8th and 9th verses, he said, Seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting, walking, sleeping, breathing, uh, speaking, emitting, grasping, opening and closing the eyes. They're not put there as a tongue twister, they have a meaning behind them. One must think about whether these 13 things being done to him are being done by him and how much he is involved in them. He must ask himself whether he's doing them. Let's take the first thing described, seeing. Are we actually seeing? Are we performing this action? In the act of seeing, which sense organ is involved? The eyes. Each of these 13 things described is a sense organ. The eyes are involved, but do we have control over our eyes? In the majority of occasions, the answer will be no. One will say that they're seeing, but that the eyes are running away. They do not have control over their seeing. It also happens that an object comes in front of the eyes and we do not see it. For example, one may be walking down the market and someone may come up to him and ask him, if you cannot see where he's going, or in verse 13, uh, where is the mind running away to? If we were to describe it in terms of photography, then the image came in front of the eye, but it did not click to take a picture because the mind was somewhere else. Therefore, I do not have control over the process of seeing. Therefore, in renouncing karmas, one should first remember that they are not seeing. This is not happening through the efforts. Is the process of hearing under our control? The answer you'll get is no. There are many occasions where does not, one doesn't want to hear and yet still hears. When we're sitting at a Gita discourse, trying to listen, somebody outside may sound the horn of the car, which we may not to hear, want to hear, but the sound still reaches the ears and is registered inside. Is this control? It also happens that what we wish to hear escapes our hearing. The process of hearing is not under our control and the sense organ of this process is the ear. The sense organ of the process is of touching is a skin. One doesn't have control over this. With the process of smelling, one does not have control of the sense organ that's the nose. There are many occasions when a smell comes that we don't wish to smell 
and the consequences that we feel that we're about to sneeze. We do not have control over the process of smelling. Next, do we have any control over the process of tasting? Guruji was once giving a discourse in Surat and there was a someone called Dilip Pai. He had a very voluptuous nature. It is a characteristic for people from the town of Surat. Anyone from there? Okay, so I won't offend anyone here. Surat in Gujarat, they speak very freely and Dilip Pai was like this. He stayed there for three or four days. He heard the saying that you eat in Surat and die in Kashi. And you can only truly experience this when you go to the town of Surat. People just kept talking about food. They'd wake up early in the morning and start eating their food. The first thing they would say is what food is going to be today. The first thing, I see someone's laughing. Uh, <laughs> um, so what food is going to be? When they're eating in the morning, they'd first ask about which food is going to be made in the evening. That is all they would talk about. Forgive me if you're from Surat, but Guruji has experienced this. He heard this for two or three days and he asked Dilip Bhai, why doesn't he think about anything but food? They would not have any other conversations in the house. He asked him the reason for this. He told him that, tell you the truth, us people from Surat are very knowledgeable in three ways. First, we know our paths, and our paths are very good. You must have done good karmas for which we've been given this human body, because our scriptures say that one would have to go through 1.4 million births and have done good deeds to attain a human birth. So he said, we know our paths very well. We also know that the present, that all the tastes of food, be it sweet, salty, sour, bitter, astringent or pungent, can only be consumed by a human. Only a human can enjoy these tastes and no other creature, which is true. By the way we're living our lives, we also know the future. In the future, only one taste is certain, grass, when you're lying on the floor. This is because based on our karmas, we only done grass is going to come. Therefore, we should only consume the fruits of our karmas at the moment. This is in fact bad knowledge in three ways. What Guruji means to say is a human being doesn't have any control of the sense organ of taste. For the process of walking, the sense organs are the feet. There is no control over this. For the process of sleeping, the sense organ is the mind. While the mind is, when the mind is sleeping, then one can get sleep. But if the mind's not sleeping, one can't get any sleep. The mind should also go to sleep. For the process of breathing, the sense organ is the nose. Guruji always says that when one is breathing, that they should stop making any efforts. Just see how you can breathe without making any efforts. When you stop making efforts, then you'll be able to breathe and very slowly as well. For the process of talking, the sense organ is the mouth. We have no control over this. We sometimes say after speaking that what we said, we don't mean to say that. The very fact that someone says this shows that they have no control over their speaking. For the process of emitting, there are many sense organs starting with the hands. Some scriptures say that when toxins from the skin are being collected and thrown away, then the sense organ for this is the anus, but also the skin because sweat leaves the skin. Do we have any control over this? Can we ever say that we should not sweat? This is no control and it all leaves by itself. You cannot check it. The rubbish that is collected in the nose and the mouth is thrown away and the whole skin is uh, performing this process. This is called the city of the nine gates. Just like many activities are taking place in this city, many activities are also taking place in the skin. We have no control over this. For the process of grasping, the sense organs are the hands. For the process of opening the eyes, the sense organ is a life breath. For the process of closing the eyes, the sense organ is also the brown, the life breath, because it's as a result of the wind that the eyes are opening and closing. If there's some dirt in the eyes, then water may come out of the eyes, but opening and closing the eyelids will get rid of the dirt. In all these processes, we have no control. If one starts paying attention to all these processes and starts thinking little, then they'll be ex able to experience the fact that they're not performing these processes. For example, I breathe, but I still do not breathe. I walk, but I still do not walk. These processes are being done by the body, and yet I am not performing them. When one begins to experience the fact that they're not performing these things, then they renounce all karmas in this world. All these 13 processes are not being performed by you. What is the meaning of renouncing something by the mind? It means to give up these things to the mind after knowing that one is not the performer. Our scriptures go further and say that one should renounce the attitude that he is the doer. The action should also be renounced from the mind. One should not have the attitude that he is not the doer. 
a Rashi is performing the action and is not making the action be performed. We already understand this, what it means when someone is not performing the action, but we also must understand what it means when we say that someone is not making the action be performed. This can be understood through a simple example. Our scriptures say that when the sun is rising, then all processes start happening. Many act different activities begin with the rising of the sun. The farmer begins farming his crops, those performing penances uh, begin doing their prayers, Brahmins begin reciting the Vedas, shopkeepers open their shops, students go to school, many people, different people begin performing these activities. All these activities that are performed can be either good or bad. Good deeds may be performed and wrong deeds may also be performed. The sun does not have any responsibilities for any of these activities being performed. One say, may say that he got up because of the sun, opened a shop and lied to someone in order to get his money. The son does not have responsibility for the fact that he lied to someone. He may say that he only opened the shop because the sun was shining and that he wouldn't have opened the shop but the sun was shining. But the son will say, I do not have accept any response for, for this. I just rose because I have to rise. You have responsibility for all the actions you performed. The son does not lie to anyone and it does not make the shopkeeper lie to anyone. The shopkeeper performed the action and had the independence to do this. When the sun rises, then someone can use that light for good purposes or for bad purposes. The responsibility of this does not lie with the sun. If you get a knife from shops, then you can either use that knife to cut vegetables in your kitchen or to kill someone. The shopkeeper that sold you that knife does not have responsibility for either of these actions. If one asks the shopkeeper why this person stabbed someone with a knife, then the shopkeeper will say that he doesn't know and he just sold him that wife so he, uh, uh, knife so he could cut vegetables with it. When Guruji was in New York a while ago, then he heard a very interesting case. Um, he doesn't know what the result was, but when the internet was launched on personal computers, it instantly became popular and it, you see the popularity today. There is an Eastern European girl living with her parents in Queens in New York. Her parents had bought a, a computer with an internet connection. The internet's used now very regularly over the world and we understand that it has good uses as well as bad uses. We can use the internet for great purposes and if we do, we get saved from its bad effects. This girl was 13 years old and was taught how to use the internet at school and so got comfortable with using the computer. She eventually became an addict of the internet. A new phrase is now widespread in America called computer widows. Before there were war widows where a soldier would be at the battlefield and if he lost his wife, then his wife would be like a, it would be a widow and her husband would only come back basically once a month if he didn't die. So if the husband died in war, then the wife would be called a war widow. Now the phrase computer widows is used. The addiction is so great, that if someone sits down to use the internet for a few hours, they could spend the whole night without use, uh, knowing where all the time went. He would not have spent interest in anything else. This girl had so much interest in the internet, she would spend all night using it while her parents slept. While using it at night, she came into contact with people who were doing wrong activities. She joined chat rooms where she would talk to the wrong people. The 13-year-old naive and innocent girl didn't know what was going on, but the people that came into contact with her began exploiting her and abusing her. After six or seven months went, her, her parents found out what was going on. Her mother picked up the phone once and found out. She investigated and found out that in those six or seven months, the girl was having intimate relations with paedophiles who were double or triple her age on the internet. She would meet them in hotels and other places where they would do these wrong activities. The parents were completely shocked. A case started from this and the American press covered it. When the American co uh, press cover a controversial story, they cover it into detail. Guruji was there at the time and he asked questions after reading it. The girl had her own lawyers and the parents had their lawyers. The girl said that she had not done anything wrong and her parents were harassing her rather than letting her use the internet. Her parents told her that she couldn't use the computer and the case started. The girl's argument was that the thing she did was as a result of her parents buying her that computer, giving her a connection to the internet and teaching her how to use it. She said that those were the reasons why she did it. She said the fault was the parents and not hers. Imagine when her parents got her that computer, 
Did they have these things in mind for her? Did they buy it so they, she could do these activities at night? What I'm trying to ask is who is responsible for all these actions being performed? A person can be introduced to good or bad things, but the decision to go on that path is taken by us and not anyone else. Nobody can force us to take a certain path. The Vashi that Shri Krishna is describing in this verse, who is a, a Samkhya Yogi, a person in the path of wisdom, and a Karma Yogi, takes so much care that he neither works nor causes, as it says here, not causes work to be done. If another person is doing an activity in front of him, then that's the other person's business. And this person doesn't keep such a thing in mind. When he's performing Karma Yoga, then he can say that the other person improved because of his inspiration. That's why he can say that nobody got worse as a result of his inspiration. He doesn't want fame from having improved the other person, and yet he doesn't want to take any responsibility if the other person carries on the wrong path. This is a state that such a yogi reaches, and it says that he rests at ease in the city of nine gates, the body. He's at peace. Our scripture says that he, this means that he knows who he is and lives naturally. This is his experience. The state of being at ease is when one is intact and interested in one thing only. When someone is steady on the support of all supports, which is God, then he is at ease. The feeling of being at ease is as a result of efforts in trying to attain the soul. All these verses are interconnected. In the 13th verses of, uh, 13, 13, first 13 verses of this chapter, Shri Krishna describes how one should live, and here he describes it in a very beautiful way, in the city of the nine gates. The body is a city of nine gates. What are these nine gates? Who knows? Who knows? That's exactly correct, exactly correct. With everywhere in the body where there's a hole. And how should one live in the city of ease? The, nine, the scriptures say that seven of these nine gates are in the face alone. The two eyes, uh, two ears, two nostrils and one mouth. That's seven gates. Then we have the sex organ and the anus added that makes nine gates. This is the city of the nine gates. The path of yoga states that when a person dies and his life goes away, then the life, the pran, goes from one of these nine gates or nine holes. A wise person will understand which of these nine gates the life goes out of. A simple test is that the gate from which the life goes out, it looks a little wet when the person has died, as if that person has sweated there. But when a person who is att to attain liberation and his karmas are finished so that his last life leaves his body, then his life does not leave through any of these nine gates. It leaves from the Brahmaran, the plane of Brahman. In the 7th and 8th chapters of the Gita, we'll see how this is done. Slowly and slowly, one moves the life breath and closes each of the nine doors, one after another. Just like when you go out of a town after a long while, you first close the bathroom window, then you close the window of all the rooms. It's exactly the same. You close the shutters and then the curtains and the balcony. You do this one thing after another, so nothing remains open. This prevents something, things such as pigeons coming inside the house, and creating bad smells as other things, a yogi prepares as carefully when he leaves the body to go to the ultimate abode by closing each of the doors of the senses one after another. He keeps moving his life breath up throughout his life until it leaves out from the Brahmaran, the plane of Brahman, and he then leaves his body. Who are we in the city of nine gates? See here, the word Dehi is used. The word Dehi it me used meaning one who resides in the body. Our scriptures even go to say that we are atiti in the body. Who knows what atiti means? Atiti means a guest, but we have to understand its meaning further. It means one whose time is not confirmed. The time we came was not, uh, was not confirmed and the time we will not go is not confirmed. The times and of our arrival and departure are not confirmed and that is why our times in this body are not confirmed. Then who is at rest in this at ease in the city of nine gates. Only one who understands who he is can rest at ease in the body and in the material world. Only one who lives in the body as atiti and lives in the material world as atiti can get peace in life. One who learns to live as atiti can rest at ease, but one who tries to live as the owner can never live at ease. The mistake we all make is that we come as atiti, as guests, but we try to become an owner. This is when conflicts start happening. 
If you're living in someone else's house as a guest, then you can say that you're not going to leave the room because, uh, and you claim that that room is yours, then difficulties will begin. If one comes into this world as an atiti, as a guest, then they should live, learn to live as atiti. You have not created this city. If you have made a house, then you can use it as you wish. We can decide all the plans, design all the rooms and choose all the fittings. We choose all the furniture to go inside the house, be it the telephone, modem or the fridge. All these things are our preferences. If you have created this house, then it's fine. Can we say that we have created the city of nine gates? No, because we have not chosen any of these things that are in the structure of our bodies. If you like this body, then you're in, then you'll be happy to arrive. But if you do not like it, then you will have a complaint. Every person has a complaint. They wish that the eyes would look different from what they are. They said that they didn't have a choice in it. Did God say, because you came into the, that from his department store, the body department store, you have a separate counter for the nose or for the eyes, where you could choose uh, which nose you prefer or which eyes you prefer? Did we have this choice? No, we didn't. All of these things came and were fitted into us. People always have the complaint with these things. Having conducted experiments, psychologists say that if humans have a favorite pastime of what they do when they're free, they will be looking in the mirror and checking their appearance. They make these many different faces in front of the mirror. Why do they do this? Every person do, does this. Even I do this. If I do it, then it automatically means that you do it. <laughs> Why do people do this? Psychology says, say that there's a deep dissatisfaction in this. People wonder that if their noses were different, then this would look better. And this, that's why they play with their noses. This is a favorite pastime of human beings. None of these things were their choice. That is why you are atiti, a guest. You have created, you've not created any of these. Who has created them? God has created them. Not only that, he has created them with a fixed motive. When we do things, then we do them as a pastime, but there is no pastime for God. He does everything with a fixed motive. He has a definite motive, he has a cause. When we say that without God's wish, not even leaf can move, then that, does that not mean that we are limited? It just means that everything is God's planning. And he is such a great planner, he is such a perfect planner, that with all the things happening in the world, he still has control over each and every one of them. He is a master planner. People use this meaning to show their limits. The phrase that not even a leaf can move without God's wish is 100% true, but do not see your limitation in that. See God's planning in that, and then love for God will be born. You have a strong faith towards God, and this is God's planning. You have come in the city of nine gates as Atiti, as a guest. You have not the crate to the city, nor is there anything of your preference in the city. There is nothing of your choice in the city. Your parents have not even created the city because your parents did not even create the genetics. If they did, then every child born in this world will be created in the way that the parents like. Many people think that children do not get born to parents who do not want children. When children get born, then do they go to buy sweets? Yet the child the child doesn't get born. There's a story that Kachalal went to the office and he was wearing a frown on his face. His colleagues nearby asked him what happened and why he had such a sad look on his face. Kachalal said that his eighth child is getting born and he's unhappy that uh, the boy is getting born. If the parents created the child, then they, they would be able to decide when the child comes, yet this doesn't happen. Not even the parents have created the child. Who has created it? Ultimately, we get to the fact that God has created the city of nine gates. God has created the body with a definite purpose. Just like God has made my body with a definite person, he has done the same with everyone else's bodies. There is a definite motive behind each and every body. Let us generalize this now and come to a conclusion that everything in this world, including the bodies of not just humans, but also other creatures, such as ghosts, water, consciousness, and everything else is created by God. Isha vasyam idam sarvam yatkinchi jagatayam jagat, meaning whatever is moving in this world is pervaded by God. And God has created them, and as I say again, God has created them with a fixed and definite motive. People say that this world is chaos, and it's a biochemical reaction. It's not a biochemical reaction, there's a purpose behind it all. It's a system and a perfect system. What do I have to do when I reside in this body? It's important in the system that each and every part of the system is working perfectly. When verse 13, 
Only then will the system work. Otherwise, the system will not work. There are many such cities, and the king of cities as well as the owner is God. In India, there are many cities such as Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, Bangalore, and there is one president or a mayor, one mayor in all of these cities. In the same way, the mayor or president of all these cities, that is our bodies, is God. And he has a re reason for creating all these cities as well as what is to be done in each of these cities. The president as a purpose is of course for these cities, but the, do the cities know it? How can the president govern all of these cities at the same time? He has placed his representative in each and every city. A president of a country can't travel in each and every city, yet the representative is there in each and every city. Sutre Mani Gara Eva, meaning I reside in all creatures, as Sri Krishna says in um, verse 15 of chapter 15 in the Gita. But he's definitely left a controlling figure there at the door. The controlling figure is the mind. The mind is the mayor of the city of the nine gates. He has been given control of it. Is the mayor traveling in the right direction? Because if the mayor is good, then the city will improve. But if the mayor is bad, then the city will get worse. The mayor should be left in the president's control. When the mind goes towards the supreme soul and stays in the control of the supreme soul, then the city will thrive by itself. The city will be purified by itself. The city will develop. And when the soul that resides within understands himself as Atiti, then he'll be rest, able to rest at ease inside the city. If the city of London has a clean mayor, is in the hands of a clean uh, mayor, then uh, a clean mayor in the hands of a clean prime minister, then each and every person in London will think that London is not there because they've left their hometowns and come to London, let's say, 30 years ago, and everyone just came there to earn money and work hard, and everyone will make efforts without considering where they came, what they came with, and what they leave with. If they do this, then they, uh, if, if they do this, then they won't leave anything, and it won't make a difference to them. Therefore, everyone that lives in London will try to make it as beautiful a city as possible. If every one of the millions of people living in London thought it'd be like this, uh, it would be good. Then uh, London will become green, clean, and beautiful by itself. In the same way, if each and every soul that comes inside the human body thinks that he has not come into the city with anything and will not leave the city with anything, then throughout that time they're in a the city, they'll develop themselves because they are atiti, guests. The city is not theirs. If you're atiti, then you reside as if you're atiti and all the bliss in this is in this. In the Srimad Bhagavat discourses, Guruji says over and over again that if you want to live, enjoy life, then live life as if you are a guest. There is no happiness or fun in living life as an owner. The Supreme Soul has put him in such a field that every seven days he resides at a different person's house. He goes to so many different houses and meets many different people, particularly when he goes abroad and the people in houses he stays with him make such detailed preparations where they save the nicest room in the house for the guests. This applies to all guests. When you go to somebody's house, they always leave the nicest room for the guest. A room that's absolutely clean, with nice furniture, beautiful flower arrangements, and soft pillows. When we see all of this, then what thought should come into our minds? That the person in whose house you come into as a guest is so nice and has looked after you so well. The thought must come into your mind. You think that they're nice and cultured people and good hosts. In your mind, you immediately have strong feelings for them and have a lot of love for them because they've looked after you so well. You therefore think that you should give something back to them. When you go out shopping, then you immediately think about buying the child of the host uh, a gift and think that you should buy something for them. You think that you should buy something for your host's daughter. You think that you should buy something for the host's wife and also the host. These thoughts immediately come to the mind. Why? They did not ask for it, and they, nor did they demand it, but because of the way they treated you and the way they looked after you, you have strong feelings for them. These are the qualities of a true guest. But if you go to someone's house as a guest and they treat you well, look after you and make preparations for you, and then if you think they did it because they should do as hosts and start complaining about it, then you would not go out and buy something for them or leave uh, something for them. Even if you do not get something for them, it does not change their feelings because they know that you are in their house as guests, as atiti, and it's their duty to look after you because their ancestors have passed these good manners to them. Why are you in somebody's house as a guest and you have no worries when you go to work 
and all your pillows and covers get changed. You have no worries about doing the laundry. All these worries only come if you're living in your own house. If you go to somebody else's house as a guest, then you have no worries. Now, everything has been taken care of after staying there for five to seven days. You think that in your house, you do not have any vases as good as theirs. If you, this situation comes and you're doing your packing and time for departure comes, you quickly pick up the vase and you put it in your bag. The host family are very cultured and therefore they do not make you open your bag, but they know that their vase is gone. Therefore, the next time you go there, there's a broken vase rather than a new one placed in your room. And instead of your vase, your attention may fall on something else that also falls into your bag. After three or four times, the host in whose house you're staying will find out about this and realize that all their belongings are disappearing. When you call to let the host know that you're coming to stay for the fifth time, and then they say they're actually going out of that <laughs> town during that time, they very subtly say they can't come again because they've treated you well as a guest, yet you did not know how to behave as a guest and became, began acting like an owner. The items are there for your use and you should have used them. In the same way, the city of nine gates is made as God's house and you are staying there as a guest. What will happen if you create a sense of ownership? Every single sorrow in life is a result of one thing and that's thinking that one is the owner rather than guest. One thinks that the body is theirs. If the body is theirs, and then they need all the things that the body needs. If the body needs a house in which to live, then they'll think that the house is theirs. If the body needs new clothes to wear, then they'll think that the clothes are theirs. If the body needs new shoes to wear, they'll think that the shoes are theirs. If the body needs fame, then they'll think that the fame is theirs. And everything the body needs is made is his because they've made the body their own. They've made the costume theirs and there's a big burden with it. There is no problem with having costume, but the burdens that they have in the pockets give them a lot of sorrows. This is what hurts them. Therefore, you should let go of the costume and then all the sorrows in the pockets will go themselves. Then you will rest at ease in the city of nine gates. Only as a guest are you able to live at peace. This small concept has been given to you, but then you should think about how you can live as a guest. One has to be careful so they ensure that they're living even in their own house as a guest. Boys aged 18 or 19 are very bright. They make a complete mess of their own rooms and the houses and nothing's in order and they have a post on their bedroom saying, it's my mess and I love it. But if you go to somebody else's house, then can you leave such a mess? In this case, you would be keeping everything neat and tidy and you put all the mess in your bags because you're living there as a guest. If you live in your life as a guest, then nothing remains and there's no dirt. Only when there is a sense of mindness is there a lot of dirt. If something is not yours, then how can you make it dirty? Your boss will not like it. Your host in whose house you're staying will not like it. When you have a sense of ownership, then there are sorrows. But when you have a sense of being a guest, then there are no sorrows and only happiness. We are guests in this world. Live as guests, then you'll be able to live at ease. This is the right way that Shri Krishna shows us. Verse 14.